in this video we will introduce multilayer neural networks so far you have only seen a single layer perceptron in which the computation is performed only at the output layer that is why the perceptron is referred to as a single layer network in multilayer networks the output of a node can feed into other nodes and these other nodes could be either hidden nodes or they could be output nodes so i have shown an example of a multilayer neural network in this slide as you can see the nodes in the middle two layers they do feed into other hidden or output nodes one point that you'll notice about this architecture is that it is a directed acyclic graphs graph Uh, all multilayer networks are always directed acyclic graphs furthermore they are usually arranged in layer wise fashion so what does that mean that means that the nodes of the kth layer typically feed into the nodes nodes of the k plus 1th layer now the layers between the input and the output they are referred to as hidden because they perform intermediate computations this doesn't mean that you can't examine the activations of the nodes if you want to uh, somehow examine what's going on in the inside your network what it really means is that from an input output perspective you don't see the values of these activations as a part of either the input or the output now uh, each hidden node it uses a combination of a linear transformation and an activation function this again is very similar to what we saw in the output node of the perceptron where in each node we were first applying a linear uh, transformation and then we followed it up with the sign activation and an important point about multilayer neural networks is that the use of nonlinearity in the activations is crucial in learning the capacity of uh, in increasing the learning capacity of the network in fact uh, a couple of slides on will show a result which Uh, which tells us that if you use a multilayer neural network with only linear activations it really isn't any uh, any better than a single layer network <clears throat> so uh, here i will uh, discuss some notations that are used throughout the book there are two ways in which you can represent uh, a neural network diagram one is uh what we have already seen that is the scalar notation in the scalar notation each node in the neural network uh, is shown by a circle and each edge contains a single weight on it which feeds into another computational node containing a single scalar activation however uh, this sometimes can take too much space So sometimes what we do is that we use vector notation where all the nodes in a layer are represented by a single rectangle and inside that rectangle we have a vector you can see that there's an overbar on top of the variable inside the rectangle which tells us that it is a vector and the length of that vector is equal to the number of nodes in that layer similarly uh, the edges here they represent matrices performing the linear transformation rather than individual weights in the scalar notation so for example here you can see the input layer contains five nodes and the first hidden layer contains three nodes so in the vector notation the edge between the input layer and the first hidden layer is a is a five cross three matrix so you will have to multiply the uh, vector the column vector corresponding to the activation uh, in the uh, corresponding to the input vector with this 5 cross 3 matrix in order to get the vector corresponding to the first hidden layer so in fact here i have shown uh, the transformations for each of the layers for the input to hidden layer you can see that uh, i get the first hidden vector by first performing the linear transformation with the weight matrix and then applying the activation function in element wise fashion so since all of most of these activation functions that we have discussed so far uh, they are scalar to scalar activations when you apply them to a vector they are applied in element wise fashion of course there are certain types of activations like softmax are vector to vector activations uh, which we will discuss uh, in a later lecture 
So let's talk a little bit about the use of activation functions. We already discussed a little bit about activation functions, but here we will expand a little bit more on how activation functions are chosen for the output layer or for the hidden layer. So the nature of the activation function in output uh, layers is controlled by the nature of the output. So for example, uh, if you have real valued output, you typically use identity activation. So if, if the output is unbounded, real valued, uh, you are performing, for example, regression, numerical regression with numerical targets, you will use identity activation. For binary or categorical outputs, you'll typically use the sigmoid or the softmax. Uh, and the softmax is almost uh, exclusively, uh, is almost always exclusively used for the output layer. And typically it's paired with a kind of loss which is referred to as a cross entropy loss. Again, this is a point which we will visit in later lectures. Now the hidden layer activations are almost always nonlinear and often they use the same activation function over the whole network. So the TANA activation is usually preferable to the sigmoid because it can map to both positive and negative values. The other point is that the ReLU activation, it's one of the modern activation functions. It has largely replaced the TANA and the sigmoid in many applications. And there are several reasons for this as we'll see in later lectures. One is that they are easier to train and they face fewer problems with some of the problems in neural network training. So one question here is that I already mentioned in my in the previous slide that the hidden layers are almost always nonlinear. Why do the hidden layers need to be nonlinear? Here, here we'll show that if you have a multi-layer neural network that uses only identity activation, then the computed function in all its layers reduces to a single layer network that performs linear regression. So uh, let's quickly go through uh, uh, the, the, the proof of this result. So here I have shown the transformation, the vector based transformation in each of the layers. But what I have done, each of these files, I have set it to the identity function. So what you what you can do is that you can eliminate the hidden variables. OK, so you can eliminate H1 through uh, HP plus one and uh, H1 through HK plus one. Uh, and uh, in this case, what you're going to get uh, is that the output, it becomes uh, the product of WK1 transpose through W1 transpose multiplied by the input vector. Now the this WK1 transpose, the product of WK1 transpose through W1 transpose, you can rewrite it as WXO transpose. You can rewrite it as single matrix. This is nothing but a linear transformation. So what you get is a single layer network with matrix WXO. So so this, this, this is a very important result that the nonlinearity in multilayer neural networks is crucial in increasing its learning capacity. So what is the role of the hidden layers? So the so nonlinear hidden layers, they perform the role of hierarchical feature engineering. So the early layers, they learn primitive features and the later layers, they learn more complex uh, features. So for example, if you have image data, in fact, image data is one of those types of data which where it's very easy to visualize the types of features. And uh, we will see in later lectures how the early layers, they just learn early, uh, elementary edges. The middle layers, they learn complex features like honeycombs. And the later layers, they contain complex features like a part of a face. So deep learners, this is the one of the greatest reasons for their success is that they are masters of feature engineering. And they perform the feature engineering in such a way that the final output layer is often able to perform inference with the transformed features in the penultimate layer relatively easily. So for example, uh, one of the points that you saw in the lecture on the perceptron was that a perceptron cannot classify linearly inseparable data. However, let's say that we put in nonlinear hidden layers. So let's look at how you can perform classification with nonlinear hidden layers for for data which is not linearly separable 
So here uh, I have shown an example of a data set containing just three points. These three points that's on the upper left, they are A, B and C. So now uh, what you are basically doing here is that A is minus 1, 1, B is 0, 1 and C is 1, 1. So these are all two dimensional points all in a straight line. But the problem is that B is in the middle of A and C. So B belongs to the to one of the classes and A and C belong to the other two classes. So there is no way you can draw a linear separator through these two points. Now let's say that you apply uh, a multi-layer network with a single hidden layer. And the single hidden layer uses ReLU activation, which is a non-linear activation function. Uh, and uh, let's say that the neural network learns weights that are shown in the diagram. So from the input to the hidden layer, they are uh, from x1, they are 1 and minus 1. And from x2, they are zeros. And similarly, from the hidden layer, uh, the, both the learned weights are 1. In such a case, uh, what you can show is that it learns uh, a new representation. The activations H1 and H2 uh, represent a new activation of the point. In fact, on the upper right, I have shown uh, the, the, the transform representation of A, B and C. So now A becomes 0, 1. Uh, B becomes 0, 0 and C becomes 1, 0. As you can see, you can place a linear separator between <coughs> points of one class and the other. In fact, uh, any of an infinite number of linear separators can be learned between these two classes. In fact, here, uh, uh, let's say uh, we use H1 plus H2 is equal to 0 0.5. So you can show that A and C lie on one side of the separator and B lies on the other side of the separator. Now this data set, uh, there is no way in which a perceptron can provide you 100% accuracy even on the training data. However, with the use of nonlinear hidden layers, we were able to perform a feature transformation so that a linear output layer is able to classify uh, this uh, particular data set accurately because in this case if the output is negative we'll classify uh, it to uh, if the output is greater than 0.5 we'll classify it to one class and, and if the output is less than 0.5 then we will classify it to another class so uh, here uh, you can we can in general have a feature engineering view of the hidden layer so what was really happening here so the idea really here is that all these middle layers, they take your data, convert it into a representation, which is suitable for a single layer, a single output layer to classify accurately. So, so for example, if it transforms it to linearly separable data, all that, that the output layer has to do uh, is to learn a linear hyperplane separating the two classes. So, uh, so, so, the, uh, so in general, the early layers play the role of feature engineering for later layers. Multi-layer neural networks can be viewed as computational graphs. So uh, consider the case in which each layer computes the vector to vector function fi. So the overall, so, it, so what it really does is that it computes an overall composition function, which is the composition of the function fk, fk minus 1, so on up to f1. So this is actually a very complicated function because first of all, each function is a vector to vector function. And on top of that, you have k levels of recursive nesting. This type of complex and ugly looking uh, a function, it's quite powerful and you typically can't express nicely in closed form uh, without having some type of recursion. So, uh, so, 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 so this type of architecture, uh, it, it creates some challenges. So, the, so an important question is how do we train such a network? Uh, after all, what we really want to do is that we want to compute the derivatives with respect to the parameters in all layers to perform gradient descent. But as we saw in the previous slide, the complex nature of the composition function makes this rather difficult. And the key idea, the, the key method to uh, perform the learning of this type of network is to perform back propagation. So the back propagation uses the chain rule of differential calculus as a dynamic programming update on a directed acyclic graph, which is essentially your computational graph corresponding to the neural network. 
and we will discuss details of the back propagation algorithm in later lectures.